Hi, welcome back to the second half of Session 6, History 3375, the CIA in the Third World. Now, in the first half, we looked at the historical background of Guatemala and saw the basic crisis, the conflict over the inequitable sharing of economic wealth and social and political power, and how that was challenged by the 1944 revolution, and how that challenge incorporated not only a challenge to the elite that had long governed Guatemala and other Central American countries, but also to the United States because U.S. corporations had served as close allies of the ruling elites in Guatemala and other countries during this period. And it is that challenge, particularly to the United Fruit Company, which is perceived in Washington as a threat to U.S. interests and, of course, is interpreted also as specifically a communist threat because there was indeed a communist party in Guatemala that had influence with Arbenz, although the actual reforms that Arbenz carries out were really not much different from the Roosevelt New Deal in the sense of trying to create more rapid economic development and greater competition within the economy, although it did have a considerable element of sharing of wealth through the land reform program. The reaction from the United States, initially in the form of hostile FBI dispatches, became far more serious in 1952. If we look at the first slide here for the second half, in the fall of 1952, Anastasio Somoza, who was the dictator of Nicaragua, remember Somoza was the head of the National Guard in Nicaragua in the early 1930s, had been responsible for assassinating Sandino, and ever since then essentially had ruled the country as a dictator. Somoza was increasingly concerned about events in Guatemala, which he saw as a threat to his own regime, because the idea that a dictatorial regime could be ousted and replaced by a civilian government with direct elections uh, was not something that Somoza wanted to see uh, spread among his own people or other people in Central America. So he saw the events in Guatemala as a direct threat to the stability of his own regime and was anxious to find a solution to the Guatemalan problem. When he travels to Washington, D.C. in 1952, he meets with representatives of the United Fruit Company and also the CIA. And they begin constructing a plan, Operation Fortune, uh, to oust the Arbenz government. The plan focuses in part on the activities of a military officer, a now ex-military officer who was living in Honduras and working as a furniture salesman uh, named Carlos Castillo Armas. Castillo Armas had been a rival of Arbenz and desperately sought political power. And he was more than willing to head a rebellion against the Arbenz government in order to replace Arbenz with, of course, himself. What the United Fruit Company and the CIA and Somoza agreed to was a plan under which the United States, through the CIA and with the assistance of the United Fruit Company that would supply the ships, would provide arms to Castillo Armas and help train and launch a rebellion led by Armas that would overthrow the regime. All of this is put into action in the fall of 1952. And the arms are being shipped on United Fruit steamers out of U.S. ports when Harry Truman, who was aware only in superficial degrees of the plan, is fully informed of what's going on and immediately calls a halt to the operation. Not because he wasn't hostile to Arbenz, obviously he was. The plan wouldn't have gotten this far if there was an intense hostility towards the regime. But his fear was that the plan was too obvious, that there'd be international exposure, and therefore the United States would be seen as violating its past commitment to non-intervention, something it had upheld during the Roosevelt administration under the good neighbor policy, that now it had cast that aside and was intervening uh, in the affairs of this small Central American country and trying to oust its democratically elected president. Uh, that kind of international attention, particularly at a time when the United States 
uh, was effectively saying that it was rallying uh, the forces of democracy against the threat of Soviet communism and totalitarianism and against Chinese communism uh, was a very significant one because it would mean a major blow to the U.S.'s uh, worldwide image as the defender of democracy, and yet here it is overthrowing a democratically elected government. So the problem was the risk of exposure, not the fact that Truman didn't want to see Arbenz overthrown. Now, by the summer of 1953, once the Eisenhower administration is in place, planning is already underway for a new, uh, more subtle, uh, and hopefully less likely to be exposed operation, uh, which is given the name PB Success. And again, these names don't really have any particular meaning. The whole idea is that uh, it's not even an acronym. It's just a code word so that even if uh, you find a coded document with this word in it, you'll have no way, even if you can decode it, you'll have no way of knowing well, what is Operation PB Success, unless there's some other evidence there. So they just give them these names to use as code words uh, in discussing the operation. One step in the direction of Operation PB Success was to appoint a new U.S. ambassador to Guatemala. And despite what U.S. officials will always say about, well, you know, it was time for a change. You know, the administration had changed, so we were changing uh, U.S. ambassadors. The fact is uh, that the new U.S. ambassador, a man named John Purifoy, uh, was chosen specifically because he was a vehement anti-communist. Uh, he had worked uh, in the eastern Mediterranean combating what he saw as uh, communist influences in Greece and so forth. He was a brash, outspoken, aggressive individual, by no means the typical type of U.S. diplomat that operated around the world. I mean, this was a person who would go in from the first day and make it clear that he wanted Arbenz gone, that he wanted nothing to do with Arbenz. He barely ever met with Arbenz. Uh, how they ever paid any attention to him, spent most of his time talking to the military, uh, who he hoped to influence, talking to members of the elite, the opposition, uh, had hardly anything to do with the elected government that he was sent uh, to represent the United States before. So there is a specific purpose for choosing him as the ambassador. We'll see another case of this when we come back to Central America and look at Nicaragua. Then uh, these U.S. ambassadors just don't happen you know, to wind up in these places at these times. They're chosen for these characteristics. The U.S. wanted somebody that was going to push and pressure our bends and really work to encourage uh, the opposition in general to take action against its own elected government. Another step in the direction of PB success was to diplomatically isolate Guatemala. And this happens at the Caracas Conference, Caracas, Venezuela, March 1954. This was a gathering of the foreign ministers of the various Western Hemisphere governments to discuss inter-American affairs. By now, the United States uh, looked upon itself as the leader of uh, the Western Hemisphere's security interests. And this was a conference to discuss various issues involving U.S. and Latin American security. And one of the things uh, that John Foster Dulles does when he goes to the Caracas Conference is to push through a declaration denouncing communist influence and communist subversion in Latin America and the fact that that must be aggressively confronted wherever it happens. Now, they didn't say the name Guatemala, but it was an effective way of sending a message uh, to every Latin American government that the United States was declaring Guatemala, or at least the Arbenz regime, persona non grata in the Western Hemisphere just as we saw last week, but even in a more direct and deliberate fashion here, uh, the U.S. government is letting other governments in the region know you don't want anything to do with Guatemala. You don't want to reach out and help this country because they're on our enemies list and it would behoove you to stay away from them. So this is one step in this diplomatic isolation process to make sure that Guatemala is not going to find 
uh, allies in the region who will try to protect it from any actions that the United States might take. A further escalation of the confrontation with Guatemala comes in what's known as the Altham uh, incident. The Altham was a steamer, a freighter, coming from Europe and carrying weapons made in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, of course, was a part of the Eastern European regimes that were under Soviet control at this time. And when the shipment of arms is made in May of 1954, it is denounced by the Eisenhower administration as an obvious sign of the close connections between the Soviet Union and the Arbenz regime, which it is all but calling, without saying it, a communist government. Now, why were these weapons being bought? from Czechoslovakia because the U.S. government had refused to sell any weapons to the Arbenz regime for its military. In the past, the U.S., of course, had supplied all of the weapons for the Guatemalan military. And the Guatemalan government, down through the decades, had been buying these weapons regularly uh, from the U.S. But now the U.S. government wouldn't sell any weapons to the Arbenz regime, so there were no weapons for the military, so they went out and bought them where they could, which was in Eastern Europe. But this, of course, is taken as another sign, even though they're essentially forcing them. If they're going to get any weapons, you'll have to buy them in Eastern Europe. Although they've essentially forced this on Arbenz, nevertheless, he's then denounced for making an arms agreement with an Eastern European country. At the same time that this is going on, the U.S., and specifically the CIA, is providing assistance to Carlos Castillo Armas, the same man who was part of the Operation Fortune Plan of 1952, helping him organize a small armed band of no more than a couple of hundred men that is going to enter Guatemalan territory and allegedly be the source of the rebellion that will overthrow the government. Now, the reality is no one in the CIA who's planning this operation believes for a minute that Carlos Castillo Amos is going to lead an insurgency in Guatemala that's actually going to overthrow the government of Guatemala. But they want to have a cover story. They want to be able to say, well, it was the actions of this insurgency which led to the toppling of the Arbenz regime. And they have other mechanisms, as we will see. The levers that they are pulling are far different from Castillo Armas, but he's going to be the cover story. They can say, well, look, at it was this courageous military officer fighting against communist tyranny who brought down the Arbenz government. Uh, he had this guerrilla army in the countryside, which they proceed to exaggerate in terms of numbers, etc. And it had no, there was no possibility that this group was going to overthrow the government, but that was going to be the cover story to explain to people, well, how did the regime finally collapse? You know, it didn't just fall apart on its own. Well, the answer is going to be it was a rebellion led by this military officer. So Carlos Castillo Amos is essentially a cover guy. He's the one that will give the excuse as to how all of this happened. Okay. Now, more importantly for the CIA, there were other mechanisms to be used. Now, if we look at the next slide, we'll see what some of those were. One of the areas in which the CIA works assiduously is in psychological warfare. Part of that is radio propaganda. The CIA sets up a radio transmitter on a small, a small island in the Caribbean, called Swan Island, uh, and uses this as a means of broadcasting programming into Guatemala, which is anti-Arbenz, and the radio station is known as the Voice of Liberation. And it reports all kinds of uh, things such as, well, Castillo Armas has, you know, gathered thousands of insurgents around him. Uh, he's attacked this town and that town in the interior, and uh, soon he'll be marching on the capital, etc., to create at least the illusion that there is a major insurgency in the countryside. They also report stories of uh, the government going out and, you know, killing landowners to uh, seize their land and turn it over to the peasants, and uh, that there's going to be a communist purge in Guatemala and that they will attack the Catholic Church and on and on. Um, 
On one occasion, they do manage to get hold of a uh, Guatemalan pilot. Uh, they get him tanked up, and uh, he talks about, well, how the uh, Guatemalan Air Force is ready to revolt against the government and so forth uh, with the purpose of creating uncertainty in the government itself. Could you trust the Air Force anymore? Or were they about to go to the other side? But all of this is designed to feed a steady stream of anti arbenz images and also images that will be unsettling to the regime itself and its supporters and make them uncertain about what is going on in their own country. Uh, at another level, uh, more basic than this in terms of psychological warfare, uh, the CIA officers in Guatemala and also people who were assisting them in the political opposition uh, would call members of the Communist Party and members of the Arbenz government uh, and members of other political parties that were supportive of the government and threatened to kill them. Hmm. Uh, they would call them up at night and say, well, we're going to kill you. Hmm. Or, you know, I know that your daughter leaves for school at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, one of these mornings, she's not going to get to school. Hmm. And so forth. Hmm. To literally just cause panic among people that they were going to, in fact, be victims uh, and be murdered in their beds or have their children killed, etc. Uh, in addition to that, the CIA arranged for the printing and posting, as they did in Iran, uh, of anti-government broadsides. In other words, they would print statements on large pieces of paper denouncing the government and telling some of the same stories as on radio liberation, because many people didn't have radios, and they'd post these up on walls of buildings, churches, schools, etc., uh, again, to promote anti-government sentiment within the country itself. In addition, they provided the basic text for sermons by Catholic priests on Sundays uh, denouncing the regime as atheistic, communistic, as threatening uh, the church itself and threatening Catholicism, threatening to destroy the basic structures and institutions of Guatemalan society. And the church, of course, was a ready ally in this case, unlike Iran, where they, you know, the CIA couldn't decide whether to try to kill the Muslim clerics or try to use them as, again, a, a source of propaganda. Here, the Catholic Church was more than ready uh, to side with the anti arbenz forces and to work closely with the CIA as it generated this material and as they inserted some of that material in their sermons. They didn't need to be encouraged to do this. They wanted to do it. Uh, the CIA simply provided them with the material that they could use to actually uh, denounce the regime and uh, use common terminology against it. Another action that the CIA takes against the regime uh, is to launch a series of bombing raids on the capital and surrounding areas. Uh, these bombing raids were not inconsequential. I mean, it wasn't like they were just throwing firecrackers. Uh, but they really weren't intended so much to do significant damage. It wasn't the idea that they were going to undermine the economy, um, uh, destroy military targets, but rather to create fear and uncertainty, particularly in the capital. Uh, they bombed, for example, uh, an oil storage facility. Uh, which, of course, created spectacular explosions, and they launched similar kinds of attacks, relatively small scale, and really it fits in with the psychological warfare. Uh, this, they know this isn't going to undermine the regime in and of itself, but instead what they want to do is, again, create uncertainty and the belief that, indeed, Castillo Amos has managed to gather around him a significant military force, not only an insurgent army, but now one that has, and supposedly this is what was happening, actually, it was U.S. pilots, uh, but supposedly one has access to aircraft and is now using those aircraft to attack uh, the government and attack the uh, structures of the national economy. The other element in this plan, uh, which was not really in the form of psychological warfare because this wasn't generally known, nor did the CIA advertise it, uh, the CIA did develop a hit list of more than 50 people that it wanted to see executed uh, as soon as the regime began to topple. Um, we have the list today, although they've blacked out all the names. Uh, <laughs> Still worried uh, about a lawsuit. But the document clearly states that the people on this list are to be killed uh, when the Arbenz regime is toppled. Uh, it's just that 
you know, they wouldn't, they still will not, even under freedom of information, give those names out. But this was another part of the plan that even if Arben should step down or be removed, they also wanted to go after, of course, we can pretty well guess, the leaders of uh, the Communist Party, the leaders of the trade unions, the leaders of other political parties that supported their regime, etc. Uh, it's not too difficult to piece together at least a significant number of the names. And in fact, many of those people would be killed later on uh, after uh, the end of the Arben's government. Uh, but this was another part in the plan. Uh, and we can separate it from psychological warfare because they had no intention of releasing this in advance. They weren't trying to scare people in this case. They just simply intended to do this. Well, with all of these factors, when the regime is toppled, the CIA will gain a greatly enhanced reputation because, although, again, the American public at this moment doesn't know what's going on here. I mean, as far as they know, there's some kind of insurgency going on in Guatemala. They know it's a communist regime, at least according to the um, U.S. newspapers and the U.S. government. So, you know, why should we care if it gets overthrown? But as far as they know, it largely consists of uh, a domestic insurgency uh, being led by some military officer down there. But over time, particularly within government circles, but then later, as the general public begins to learn about the overthrow of the Guatemalan regime and how it actually took place, there, these events enhance the reputation of the CIA even further because people look at it and say, my God, you, know, you largely managed to topple this regime through psychological warfare. You, know, you had the radio propaganda, you had some broadsides, you did a little bit of bombing, but that was really for psychological effect. You just scared the heck out of all these people and finally, the regime just collapsed in upon itself, which sounds interesting, but isn't true. <laughs> I mean, certainly, the things that the CIA did in this regard certainly helped disrupt the regime and make it harder for it to function and administer the country. But these factors in and of themselves, as the CIA well knew and as people highest in the Eisenhower administration really knew. The regime was not toppled by these factors. They helped create an environment in which the regime could be eliminated, but they were not decisive. The biggest factor was simply this. The U.S. government, through Ambassador Purifoy and through U.S. military attaches in Guatemala, made it clear to the Guatemalan military, that if Arbenz was not removed in the course of these events, with the you know, bombings and the propaganda and so forth, then the U.S. was fully prepared to launch an all-out invasion with the U.S. Marines. So the Guatemalan military was left with a prospect, well, you can go on supporting our bends, well, that's fine, but that means we're going to have to invade with thousands of Marines and we'll have to kill all of you, of course. We'll just come sweeping in and we're not, you know, taking any prisoners and we're not distinguishing between who was critical of our bends and who wasn't. We'll just kill anybody in the way and that'll probably include all of you people. Uh, and we'll destroy the military, which is, you know, the institution that, you know, gives you your place in society and so forth. That'll all be destroyed. So the leading officers in the Guatemalan military have a choice. They can either continue to support our bends, or they can face destruction by U.S. Marines. Now, in terms of the Guatemalan military, support for our bends was, in fact, declining. He enjoyed considerable support within the military at the beginning of his administration. He was, after all, himself a military man. And he was a highly respected military officer. He was very, very honest, very competent. Uh, he was admired for the role that he played in getting rid of uh, the Ubico regime, etc. But as his administration carried out 
its policies of land reform and labor codes, etc., a number of officers who were far more conservative became far more critical and far less willing to support the regime. So there's clearly a division within the military. This is not a military by 1954 that is simply standing four square behind its elected president. There are a number of officers who would gladly sell the regime down the river. However, up to the point of the American threat, there was still a majority who were supporting Arbenz and wanted to see him finish his term in office, even though they might disagree with his policies, etc., because the military officers as a group were fairly conservative. But most of them were still in favor of him at least finishing his term of office. But their decision was going to be altered by this threat. And what it comes down to, finally, is that Castillo Amos is hanging around out in the countryside and, you know, staging little incursions, etc. And the Arbenz regime feels that if it's going to put an end to this attack that's going on against it, to the propaganda and the bombing raids, etc., it's going to have to confront Castillo Amos, send the military out, crush him, and then they can say, look at all of this talk about, you know, the enemy at the gate and so forth, that Castillo's Amos' forces are about to invade here. And it's just baloney because we now have him under arrest, and here's his bedraggled little army uh, that was supposedly such a threat. So we to get this over with. We have to crush Castillo Amos, and that's it. So it sends a force of the army out to find Castillo Amos and to take him prisoner. The columns march out of Guatemala City, and as they march into the countryside, the officers make their fateful decision. They are not going to go after Castillo Amos because they know if they do that, it's the end of the CIA's operation, and the next step, as they understand it, is an all-out military invasion from the United States. Would the United States have actually done that? Who knows? It was considered a tactic by the CIA and by the Eisenhower administration. They were not actively planning an invasion of Guatemala. And it probably would have been rather difficult to convince the American people to give wholehearted support to this, simply because for most people, they couldn't care less what was going on in Guatemala. You know, it's not like, oh, well, somebody just invaded France. You know, half of them wouldn't even know where Guatemala was in the 1950s. It would simply be hard to convince the American public that this was something really worth doing, even in the midst of the Cold War, just because people would say, well, where is that? You know, what are we talking about? You'd need some time to convince people that this was a significant threat. But in any case, there were no ready-made plans for an invasion of Guatemala, but the threat was enough. It carried the necessary weight to get the military to turn around and say, no, we're not going to suppress Castillo Amos. What Arbenz knows then is that he no longer has the support of the military that they are not going to defend his regime. At this point, if we go back to the slide, you'll see that now Jorge, I mean, Jacobo Arbenz, is faced with a critical decision. If the military is no longer going to support him, will he turn to the popular groups that have supported the regime up to now, and particularly the unions. And I say the unions because the unions were mostly congregated in the capital, and they had large numbers of people as their members. And they were willing, if Arbenz would pass out weapons, to form militias and defend the regime. So Arbenz had to make this decision, was he going to arm the workers? And his decision in the end is... No, he's not going to do that. Why? Probably in no small measure because he was, after all, a military officer. Yeah. This had been his most of his life, certainly most of his professional career had been spent as a military officer. And envisioning a civil war that would pit the military against armed workers was something that he simply wasn't willing to do. He was not an individual who was an armed revolutionary. 
He was a military man, and he was the elected president of the country. And he was unwilling uh, to risk the possibility of an all-out civil war between workers on the one side and the military on the other. In the end, he refused to provide arms to the workers, and at that point, the die was cast. His fate was decided. His regime could not survive. Without the support of the military, with the ongoing pressure from the United States, and his decision not to arm his own followers to protect the regime, there was simply no hope for the survival of the Arbenz government. On June 27, 1954, Arbenz resigns from office, knowing that inevitably what will happen, he's under pressure from the military now, they're telling him he has to step down. He's already made his decision that he will not arm the workers, and therefore he must go. Uh, Eventually, he gets to the airport in the capital. He's stripped of all his clothes, uh, humiliated by the people at the airport uh, who want to make sure he's not stealing any money from the country. Uh, he was the one honest president they've had. Um, and flies off into exile. Almost... Overnight, it seemed, the regime had been toppled. Castillo Amos would become the new president after some sorting out. Purifoy had to run around telling people that they couldn't be president and threatening people who wanted to be president until Castillo Amos was finally given uh, the position for his work uh, on behalf of the CIA. Out of these events, not only is the reputation of the CIA greatly enhanced among those in the know who see this as an incredible accomplishment uh, to use essentially psychological warfare for the most part to achieve this end was seemed almost unbelievable. But in addition, CIA officers learn a certain lesson from the events in Guatemala. And if we go back to the, the slide again, we'll see. Uh, one in particular was Richard Bissell, who was Alan Dulles' key aide in the CIA. For Bissell, indeed, Guatemala was a clear example of just how fragile third world governments, and especially third world revolutionary governments, and especially those in Latin America were how easily they could be eliminated. You know, all they had to do was stir up a little bit of an insurgency, put some psychological pressure on, pressure the military, and they're gone. Bissell will carry that lesson forward to the next major CIA intervention in Cuba in 1961. Someone else is there learning the lessons of Guatemala as well, however. He's an Argentinian medical student who's been traveling through Latin America. He's a, become a committed Marxist, committed leftist. And he is in Guatemala at the time that the Arbenz government is overthrown. And the lesson that he learns is that you can't survive as a reformist government in Latin America, because the Americans will simply run all over you. They'll topple your regime, as happened to Arbenz. The lesson this student learns is that if you're going to bring about change, really serious economic and social change in these societies, you need a revolution, a real revolution, an armed revolution. that will give no and take no quarter. The student's name was Che Guevara. In a few years, he would meet up with another revolutionary named Fidel Castro. And they would overthrow the government of Cuba and eventually confront Richard Bissell and his lesson 
from Guatemala at the beaches of the Bay of Pigs on Cuba's southern coast in 1961. We will see how the lessons of Guatemala played out for both sides, both Richard Bissell and his covert operatives, and Che Guevara and Fidel Castro and their revolutionary army. Now, two very different impressions drawn from the experience of Guatemala. Now, as far as Arbenz goes, Arbenz flew into exile and spent the next several decades as almost a political nomad. Uh, it was difficult for him. He lived in Paris for a while, but uh, the United States government remained extremely hostile to him. Uh, when he tried living in Uruguay for a while, the government put all kinds of restrictions on what he could do. He had to report to the police every week. For a time, he lived in Cuba, where he felt at home for a while, but then felt that the Cuban revolution was far more extreme than the kinds of changes he had ever envisioned. And he finally moves to Mexico City, where he died in 1971. He had been in ill health. He had been deeply depressed. His daughter had committed suicide. Uh, he was a deeply unhappy man uh, who felt himself as a man without a country after the events of 1954 in Guatemala City. Castillo Amos became president of Guatemala and served until 1957 <coughs> when he was shot by one of his own palace guards. And the State Department concluded that this was probably an act of revenge by Moscow for the removal of their agent, Jacobo Arbenz. Uh, the fact is, Arbenz had no real connections with Moscow anyways. And the fact is, it almost, was almost certainly uh, a plot by other military officers who were manipulating to remove Castillo Amos. And that's how he actually got killed. After his assassination, Castillo Amos was laid to rest in a large mausoleum in the National Cemetery in Guatemala City. In 1995, people gathered outside the National Cemetery in Guatemala City uh, to welcome home Castillo um, Jacobo Arbenz. His coffin, borne by a horse-drawn carriage, was brought to the National Cemetery, and Jacobo Arbenz was laid to rest only yards from his old adversary, Castillo Amos, both in their own ways victims of the Cold War. After these events in the mid-1950s, conditions in Guatemala became extremely violent as the political center largely disintegrated. Arbenz, whatever denunciations were aimed against him by the United States, was in fact representative of uh, middle class and working class reformist interests in Guatemala. And the Communist Party, despite its acronym and reputation elsewhere, was a relatively moderate and reformist movement within Guatemala. This and other urban reform movements were largely destroyed in the years ahead by a succession of military regimes that simply exterminated labor leaders, political leaders uh, of any moderate or leftist inclination. And in fact, during the 1960s and again in the 1980s, uh, Guatemala endured long and vicious guerrilla insurgencies in the countryside as leftist movements tried to rally the indigenous population to revolution and to the overthrow of the military dictatorships that ruled Guatemala. During this time, Hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans were killed, particularly indigenous populations, peasant populations in the countryside uh, by death squads, but also by guerrilla insurgents themselves. 
a truce was finally declared to the battle between the insurgents and the government in 1996. And UN supervised elections took place in Guatemala. Uh, but although there have been elected presidents over the last decade plus, the fact is that violations of human rights remain the norm in Guatemala down to today, and the disparities between rich and poor are perhaps more acute than they ever have been. Arbenz is looked upon today in Guatemala as a martyr, as a man who sacrificed his life for national interests. And his own country can said to have been martyred by the Cold War, which was fought out within its borders over the last several decades. Now, in looking at this intervention, just as we're, when we've looked at the intervention in Iran, we need to try to put together the major pieces. How did all of this come about? How did the CIA succeed or fail? And certainly this was a success in the sense that they got rid of the regime that they wanted to dispose of. First of all, in looking at motivations, again, we have three areas. This is an oversimplification, of course, but to to make an analysis possible without getting into elaborate theories of international relations, etc., basically we can break it down and say, look, at possible economic motivations, ideological motivations, strategic motivations. And all three of these can viably be argued, and all three have been. I mean, academics have taken different positions in arguing the case here. As far as the economic motivation, certainly this is not similar to the case in Iran, where American corporations really had no immediate interest in Iran. If anything, they had no desire to be involved in Iran because they were trying to keep oil production down, and so they had no desire to see Iranian production rebuilt uh, in the early 1950s. It's quite a different case here, where a U.S. company, the most influential and powerful not only in Guatemala but throughout Central America, uh, is having its interests violated by the local government, both in terms of the government's support of the labor movement and the labor decree, and the government's enforcement, or passage and enforcement, of Decree 900, which is the land reform law, which was going to take almost 80% of United Fruits land from it in Guatemala and effectively ruin the monopoly it had on the growing of bananas in the country. Clearly, this was an important factor. Now, can we say that simply, well, the United Fruit Company had enormous influence through the Dulles Brothers and other connections, like the Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs, uh, Giant Cabot, etc.? Certainly, it had powerful connections. There is no way of arguing around it that there are these powerful linkages between the Director of Central Intelligence, the Secretary of State, and the United Fruit Company. But beyond any immediate motivations from past contacts and work for United Fruit Company, uh, the Dulles Brothers, and certainly Eisenhower, is fully aware of what's going on, see in this not only the challenge or threat to a specific U.S. corporate interest, but also for them a challenge to basic U.S. policy in the region, which was to use U.S. corporations as they had for decades as an important element, not only in U.S. overseas economic expansion, but as an important element in advancing U.S. interests, in modernizing these societies, in bringing what they believed would be stability and modernity to places like Guatemala and countries elsewhere in Central America and the Caribbean. And yet here, this policy was being challenged directly by the Guatemalan government that was threatening the interests of the largest and most important of these corporations, the United Fruit Company. Furthermore, it was relatively easy for people like the Dulles Brothers to see 
in this challenge, which stemmed largely from Guatemala's own history of economic inequality and from growing anti-Americanism based on the close alliance between American corporations and the local elite, but to see in events that transpired in Guatemala in the late 40s and early 1950s as a communist-inspired conspiracy against the United States. There are communists in the government, and therefore this is, from the, in the minds of these people, a communist-inspired conspiracy. And what could make that more clear than its attack on the United Fruit Company and the fact that this is a direct challenge to U.S. policy in this region? So the economic and ideological can easily merge uh, in this case as motivating factors and helping to justify in the minds of people like Dulles what they were about to do, because in defending the United Fruit, they can also argue, look, we're defending U.S. policy, and more than that, we're defending ourselves against communism. Now, a strategic argument has also been made, and will be made again, as we will see in the intervention in Nicaragua decades later, and that is that this is a strategically important region. It's Central America, and just south of this area, is Panama. Now, Panama is usually not counted, by the way, as a Central American country traditionally because it was part of Colombia until the beginning of the 20th century, until it be arranged to separate it from Colombia. But in any case, the Panama Canal is only a few hundred miles from what's going on here. So if there is indeed a threat from external forces, just as the United States feared European influence back at the beginning of the 20th century and used dollar diplomacy to try to fend off European challenges to its influence in Central America and the Caribbean. So too now, there is a new external threat in the form of Soviet communism, which if it can establish a land base in Central America, is in a position to threaten the strategic location of the Panama Canal, which of course is essential, uh, it continues to be essential at least through this period, for moving the U.S. Navy so that the U.S. Navy can readily move ships from the Atlantic to the Pacific and back again without that long trip around South America. Well, we can't afford to have a Soviet beachhead in Central America because then that would give the Soviets a chance to imperil our very strategic interest in the Panama Canal. So this has been another argument often. The problem with it, I would say, is that that argument does not weigh heavily in the discussions among U.S. policymakers at this time. It's not that it's not considered, but just as last week when we talked about the report on the secret history of the Iranian operation, uh, it's down the list. Okay? The real concern is to the challenge to U.S. interests and the challenge to a U.S. corporation represented by the Arbenz regime. So I think the ideological and economic factors combined bear far greater weight than the idea that this is seen as a strategic threat to the United States. But as I said, the argument has been made, and there are certainly discussions of this concern. And as we will see, a similar interpretation will be attached to U.S. intervention in Nicaragua in the 1980s on the same grounds, that you know, the Soviets could establish military bases there and they could be a threat to our strategic interests in the Circum-Caribbean. Now, looking at the factors that affect outcome. When we look at this list, again, this is the same set of factors that we talked about last time and we're going to continue talking about in the weeks ahead. As much as the CIA gains a reputation for being sort of covert wizards, and certainly the Guatemalan operation greatly enhanced that reputation because it seems like they did it really this time with smoke and mirrors. You know, psychological warfare, essentially, as a means of undermining a regime. And that's how easy it could be. Despite that image, the reality that we saw last time, and is true on this occasion, and will be true in intervention and inter after intervention, is the largest single set of factors hmm, that affect whether or not the CIA will be successful in a covert operation, have to do with conditions in the target country. When we look at Cuba, you're going to see a very different 
kind of outcome. Not because the CIA changed dramatically. In fact, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, when one of the CIA operatives is asked about what they're planning in Cuba, they say, well, it's the Guatemalan scenario. In other words, it's the same kind of thing. We're, we're using the same basic strategy to undermine you know, a, what we see as a communist regime in a Latin American country uh, to destabilize that regime and topple it with relative ease. So it's basically the same strategy. But the fact is, the outcome is radically different. Where here, yes, they topple the regime, and it's done in relatively short order. In the other case, it's a catastrophic and very public failure. And it, most of it has to do, well, not all of it, but most of it has to do with what are the internal conditions. First of all, in terms of political participation. Yes, Guatemala had enjoyed democracy since the end of the Ubico dictatorship in 1944. There had been two national elections, both of which observers generally agreed were highly democratic. But political participation in Guatemala was extremely low because most of the population consists of Native Americans, Mayans, descendants of Mayan population, who have been excluded for centuries from any kind of participation, who are generally looked down upon as racially inferior, who have linguistic barriers that separate many of them from the Spanish-speaking population at large, to incorporate them is going to take an enormous amount of time. Much of what is done under the Arbenz regime, the land reform, educational programs, public health programs, is aimed particularly at the rural population, which is overwhelmingly made up of indigenous inhabitants. But you cannot take centuries of oppression and alienation and overcome that in a matter of a few years. And it's really only when you get to the Arbenz regime, much more so than Arevalo, that you get this serious initiative, particularly the land reform, reaching out to these people and trying to demonstrate to them that, unlike the past, when the government shows up, they're not here to steal your chickens or to drag you off into some labor gang that's going to build a road, etc., or to draft you, so to speak, into the military, which means beating you over the head and dragging you off, and you never get to see your family again, that no, the government is actually here to do something for you. That is going to take decades. So in the meantime, yes, it's democracy, but it's democracy focused largely on the urban areas. So only a small percentage of the population is able to participate. And again, what that means is how much of the country do you have to affect in your covert operation? You don't have to affect the whole country. If you can gain the capital, just as in the Iranian case, here in Guatemala City, if you can control events in Guatemala City, you don't really have to worry too much about most of the population because they are not actively involved, and so they are not going to turn on you and you know attack the new regime because they simply have not yet been mobilized in support of any particular political cause. So low political participation weighs against the survival of the Arabens regime. Second question is a question of political support. And here, the deck is stacked a little bit more in favor of the regime than it is with political participation. But even though the Arbenz regime enjoyed considerable support among urban, middle, and working class people, <coughs> the fact is it still had powerful enemies, the Catholic Church, the landowning class, business groups. All of these people were adamantly opposed to a regime that was changing the old order, that was getting rid of a system where labor could be readily exploited, where people didn't have to pay taxes generally, uh, on the profits from their businesses, etc. All of this was going to be changing. And these people were adamantly opposed to those changes. So there is a vehement political opposition, even though Arbenz does indeed enjoy a majority support within the politically active population. So this one, we can say, sort of goes 50-50. Not 
overwhelmingly against the regime as the earlier factor. Coherence of the state. How well do the state institutions hold together in this period? Initially, pretty well, when Arbenz is first elected. However, as he institutes his reforms, the critical division that develops is in the military. As more military officers move into opposition. Now, even then, of course, they're not majority, but still, he cannot fully rely on the military. And once the CIA is able to affect even those officers that are still willing to let Arbenz remain in office, then it's a lost cause. I mean, the ultimate collapse of the regime stems in no small part from the fact that Arbenz, you know, his decision to resign was based on a simple fact. He was being pressured by the military. He knew he could no longer rely on the military to support his regime. And without the support of the military, he was lost. So the military was not a solid element of support within the state system for this regime. When you have divided state institutions, again, you have a system which can readily be penetrated by and disrupted by covert operations and, of course, here specifically by the Central Intelligence Agency. So coherence of the state weighs against the regime in this case. Economic conditions. Economic conditions are, again, more or less a 50-50 proposition. We can't argue that Guatemala's economy was in serious trouble in 52, 53, and into 54. Uh, there is some disruption caused by the land reform programs, but you do not see the kind of drastic decline that affects the regime in Iran because of the oil nationalization when they're unable to get oil production up right away and then have to battle to find places where they can sell their oil because of lawsuits, etc. That kind of sharp decline in national revenues is not there. So again, we have a balance between uh, these factors. The economy isn't exactly going great guns. It's not highly prosperous. Much of the population still hasn't been affected by the land reform program, despite the fact that it's being aggressively pursued. Uh, so it's kind of a toss-up. It's a neutral. Now, openness. Here, again, how effective is the internal security of this country? How capable it is it of defending its own internal security? Here is a regime that has Castillo Amos as inconsequential as his military threat may have been. But nevertheless, he is out operating an insurgency, and he is being promoted actively by a propaganda machine directed by the CIA that's depicting him as a major threat. And yet, it's really not until the closing days of his regime that Arbenz finally decides he's going to have to do something to go after Castillo Amos. In the meantime, Castillo Amos is allowed to roam the countryside and operate pretty much free as he wishes because the regime doesn't have the capacity to easily crush that kind of challenge. So, too, you have CIA operatives acting within Guatemala, helping to spread broadsides and posters, Catholic priests who are getting up and all but calling for the overthrow uh, of the elected government. And yet, nothing is done to them because, again, the regime really doesn't have the capacity to find, round up CIA operatives and suppress the people who call for seditious action against the government. So this is a regime largely lacking in the mechanisms, the means, to actively suppress challenges to it from within, actively suppress external efforts at subversion. When we add up the factors, political participation is low. Political support is a little bit in the regime's favor. Coherence of the state, bad. The military. Economic conditions, sort of a and neutral. Not great, but not catastrophically bad. And openness, 
Not good because this regime does not have a strong security apparatus to defend itself against these challenges. So three of these important internal factors are weighing against the regime. Now, as far as U.S. domestic conditions, here again, and again, as I've said last time with the Iranian case, and this will hold true through most of these cases, it's the Cold War. People really do not question the United Fruits' own propaganda saying that, you know, this is a communist regime or under attack, uh, or the Eisenhower administration, when it denounces it as a communist regime and talks about its assaults on American interests and so forth and so on, uh, most of this is taken with unquestioning concern. It's not so much that the American people are being asked to rally around some major initiative, because they're not. I mean, the whole idea of this covert operation is that it, you, know, you don't have to you know, mobilize the military, etc. But what it does do is it allows the Dulles brothers and Dwight Eisenhower to carry out this operation without having to worry about, well, gee, is Congress going to start asking questions about what's going on here and what's happened here? We, we had this aborted operation under Truman in the fall of 1952. Now we have this other operation being undertaken by the CIA. We have you know, these broadcasts of this you know, radio liberation. Who are they? You know, where's this Air Force coming from? All legitimate questions that could have been asked, either by the media or the Congress, but there's no inclination to do so. Because if the administration says that this is, look, we get a communist regime in Guatemala, and you know, it's facing some internal opposition, and rightfully so. And gee, turns out the internal opposition under Castillo Amos was able to topple the regime. Fine. So the important part of the domestic conditions in the U.S. is that cast in those terms as a communist threat, uh, people were willing to believe whatever happened in Guatemala you know, to the regime really couldn't be all that bad because they were communists after all. So the executive branch, and particularly the CIA, can operate with relative impunity. They really don't have to answer questions. They don't have to take criticism. And there is very little chance that people are going to come around asking questions and exposing the kinds of things that they had done there. So again, domestic conditions in the US weigh in favor of a successful operation because the administration and the CIA in particular have a free hand to carry out and conduct the kind of operation that they choose. As far as CIA planning and execution, here, it's certainly true that the various devices that were used, you know, the broadsides, the radio broadcasts, the bombings, etc., were all fairly effective methods of psychological warfare. And it's no question that they did, in fact, uh, have an impact. Uh, disrupting the regime and certainly raising questions even among its supporters about its survivability. But in the end, of course, the real fulcrum of power that was applied here was not the layers of psychological warfare, but the simple threat to the Guatemalan military that if they didn't cooperate, if they didn't allow Castillo Amos to essentially invade and occupy the capital, if they didn't allow this covert operation to succeed and suppressed it as they readily could have, that the U.S. Marines would invade and they'd all be destroyed. That is the decisive factor. However effective the psychological warfare was, it was not going to topple the regime. And even, quite frankly, in the end, the one other factor that plays a role here in this specific case is that even when the military decided that it was not going to chase Castillo Amos and was going to turn around and pressure uh, Arbenz to resign, he still had the option in trying to survive of arming the workers and sending them out to defend the capital and defend the regime. Because of his own background and his own beliefs, he wouldn't do that. And those factors ultimately determined the end of the Arbenz government in 1954, the end of June. But it is less the efficient 
mechanisms of psychological warfare and much more the mechanism that was used quite surreptitiously of threatening the military that finally pays off in toppling the regime. As we will see when we get to Cuba, if the regime says, oh, well, we don't care, you know, if you get some group of invaders out there, you know, we're going to mobilize tens of thousands of militiamen and so forth and come down shooting, the outcome turns out very different. So internal conditions make a huge difference, not only in terms of coherence uh, of the regime and economic conditions, etc., but simply what kind of regime are we dealing with here? Here we're dealing with an elected president who believed that he should stand by the Constitution and that he should not opt for uh, the arming of workers and pit workers against the military. But what if you've got a government that's an armed revolutionary government and a government that will mobilize and arm people? Then you get a different outcome. Putting the major pieces together. The historical crisis in Guatemala dates back through the centuries in one sense. That from the time of Spanish colonial rule through the 19th century rule by liberal elites and the coming of American corporations. The fact is that enormous disparities existed between the rich and poor and that most of the population was subject to exploitation, particularly exploitation of their labor on coffee plantations owned by the elite, banana plantations owned by American corporations. And over time, that fundamental inequality had contributed to ongoing instability. I've seen it in Guatemala all the way back to the 1840s and 50s. Rafael Carrera and his regime gave expression to that underlying resentment of exploitation by the mass of the population. The Great Depression forces the elite to surrender its control to military dictators like Jorge Ubico, who managed from the barrel of a gun to maintain order. But at the same time, new groups are mobilizing, an emerging middle class, an expanding force of organized labor. And when these groups challenged their regime in 1944, they managed to topple it. And that leads eventually to a regime that wants to expand economic opportunities, redistribute wealth through land reform, and also attack issues of American economic domination. That lies at the core of the crisis. That and the continuing opposition of elite groups within the country to this regime and the changes it was trying to bring. As far as motivations, again, you can talk about economic, ideological, strategic. I would say the economic, in terms of defending the interests of a specific and powerful and influential American company, combined with the belief that that company was one of a series of corporations which were seen as important to expanding U.S. economic interests and expanding U.S. influence in the region, and that had been through at least since the beginning of the 20th century. And with that, and the easy application of fears about communist influence that could readily be, be applied to Guatemala so that this attack on the interests of the United Fruit Company could readily be seen as a form of a communist conspiracy given the mentality of American leaders at this particular historical period. Strategic interest can be argued, but I would say the evidence is not there to make a strong case uh, that this was a powerful motivating force for people like the Dulles brothers and Eisenhower in 1953 and 1954. And as far as tactics, here we see mostly the focus on psychological warfare, even the paramilitary part of the operation, Castillo Amos and his uh, small insurgency is really meant more to have psychological impact and to provide a cover story 
for the toppling of the regime. So it can be said in the end that the regime was toppled by an internal insurgency. But the most important tactic in the end is the threat of US military power. This was not a military which, as in Iran, was anxious and willing to get rid of the regime. There certainly were many people in the military that were increasingly hostile towards the regime. But there were also many officers still willing to allow it to at least finish its term of office. But the threat to the military itself and to Guatemala as a whole from a U.S. intervention, armed intervention, military intervention, finally swung the military. And that becomes the most important tactic in determining what will happen in Guatemala. Finally, as far as the outcome and factors that determine that outcome. Factors that weighed particularly heavily against the regime were low political participation because of the status of the indigenous population. The coherence of the state, where increasingly the military was being alienated from the regime and would finally be convinced to abandon it entirely and the lack of internal security, which allowed the CIA to act with relative impunity, much as it had done in Iran, in terms of sending agents in to operate within this internal environment, and the regime is largely incapable of or unable to suppress these agents or to even go after until the last minute Castillo Amos, who was you know, the most prominent element of this operation, at least domestically speaking. Those factors combine with the fact that the CIA and the administration in the environment of the early 50s and the Cold War could operate without a lot of hindrance from Congress or questions being asked by the public. These factors are the ones that combine to bring success to this operation. But again, as we will see, if you change the domestic conditions, and the Cuba will be a case where domestic conditions, the internal conditions in the target country are very different. You change those conditions and suddenly strategies and tactics that seem to be highly effective in many other cases and are highly effective suddenly fail to fulfill their promise. And when that happens, we will see, of course, a sea change, at least for a time, within the Central Intelligence Agency itself. Part of that failure grew out of the success of Guatemala because it convinced so many in the CIA that indeed these kinds of minimalist tactics, such as psychological warfare, could indeed bring about the toppling of regimes with very little effort on the part of the CIA. That was not always going to begin the case because, in fact, internal conditions would vary. When they do, outcomes will be very different. We'll see that as we go along and look at the next few cases. That'll be next time. Thanks.